Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm Hugo Smitter. I'm coming, visiting, very excited to be here, and I'm visiting from the west coast of Florida. So yes, it's raining here, it's snowy, but I prefer to be here than dealing with natural disasters in, in Florida. So anyways, um, I work for FICO, um, and when I say FICO, people think immediately your credit score, right, those three digits, right? But it turns out that there's more to FICO than just credit scores. You know, FICO has a whole suite of services and capabilities to help customers make better decisions. You know, if I can sum up what FICO software group does and provides to clients, is the ability to make better decisions. Um, and the way they help make better decisions is through three pillars, a decisioning technology, optimization technology, and analytics, which goes from scorecards and machine learning models all the way up to Gen AI. Now, the, the way we use these three pillars is through what I call a virtuous cycle, where we ingest customers' data and we help them um, use these three pillars to come up with new, better decisions and then operationalize those decisions in their processes, look at the outcomes, and then rinse and repeat, right? You, you bring more data in and you can make decisions and look at that loop. So when you look at FICO's evolution, FICO's been in business for 68 years. And yes, it began with credit score, Mr. Fair, Mr. Isaac, they developed a machine learning model, if you will, in 1956, that was able to predict people's uh, propensity to pay their loans. And they licensed that algorithm to uh, banks that took that and um, the whole industry of credit score came in. Um, FICO has revolutionized lending as well as mortgage loans. Um, and in the past 10 years, it has reduced uh, credit card fraud by two thirds using various technologies. But what you see in this graph is that a, a whole ecosystem of products evolved from that credit score in, in, in beginning. And th like it may happen in your shops, these different point solutions evolve by themselves. In fact, some of these are very successful products at FICO that have their own profit and loss. Now, towards the middle of this decade, or toward the middle of the 2010s, we realized that we were not drawing enough value out of these solutions, that customers were looking at ways, four ways to recombine the capabilities into more creative ways to produce value for their companies. So we embarked on a journey to make Platform the first citizen in the company rather than these siloed um, offerings. Because when you do that, you can monetize better the outcomes, you can mix these components in, in, better, in better ways and then produce value for your clients and for your partners as they use your platform. But with that power comes uh, a, 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 a technical problem, which is you're con interconnecting components in more complex ways, and that creates friction. Um, if I look at these point solutions, I'll pick one, which is one of our, our bigger, uh, a bigger capabilities are most noticeable is fraud. So fraud deals with the, the fraud in the sense of the whole life cycle of a customer before you book the customer all the way through their life cycle with your company. So credit, credit, uh, credit card payment fraud. These are, this is a field that I equate to war. You have bad guys out there that are looking for surface, uh, surfaces of attack to yourselves as consumers as, as well as your companies. And then the good guys are finding a ways to react and counter that. It's, it's actually, it's, it's an arms race. And how that translates in technology is we have tools that predict various ways where bad guys can come in and attack. Now that technically translates into capturing events 
in real time and capturing features in real time and creating models that predict in multiple dimensions and in time what may be happening and what is fraudulent and what isn't. That's the, the essence of doing fraud detection. Now, this creates an explosion of events because customers, our customers come in and say, look, we have, we have a new model. We have to add new variables and so on. So what could be 3,000 transactions per second explodes into 30,000 transactions internally as you capture various features in different dimensions. So I'm mentioning this because that's one of the drivers to look at better ways to handle our events. Now, going back to the story around platform, yes, I, I mentioned this virtuous cycle of ingesting data, applying our three pillars, and then helping customers make better decisions. We are ingrained into the customer's platforms. So those decisions go back to the customers as operationalized things that happen in their companies. And then they observe the output and see if the outcome is better or worse. And then you tune your data, you tune your decisions and off you go. That's what we offer in essence. Now, as, as, as we're offering our uh, capabilities, we're also looking at where we're heading. So the trend for us is to decompose. So we're decomposing and we continue to decompose our capabilities into smaller and more granular uh, components that we can combine and recombine in different ways, creative, not just us, but our customers and partners to create value and attack different use cases. Now with that comes the problem of interconnectivity of these components. So enter our decision to look for a better middleware to handle uh, not just our fraud capabilities, but North Star in general, where we're heading. So that's where the story our journey took us. We decomposed looking at business capabilities, but that wasn't granular enough. We were not moving at enough with enough velocity. So we started looking at decomposing these business capabilities into architectural services, and those in turn into more granular services. And one of them is the event service, which I, I worked on in, in our software selection, and that's the the uh, actor in this story, if you will. So the background of our software selection is a set of principles. And I'm just mentioning four because those also drive our selection uh, towards Dapper that we'll, I will discuss in a minute. So API first, uh, not only we were decomposing, but also adopting newer and better ways to build our software. API first is one of them. Um, better separation of concerns, abstraction and isolation, and a declarative model. The heart of our platform is a repository that allows us to model what's coming from our auth authoring system and model those entities into a logical model that then we decouple from the deployment layer. So where we deploy, it doesn't matter. It may be AWS, Google, Azure, or whatever it is. So th this is the backdrop to selecting a new software for our event service. Now, when you look at the market for event service software, you'll find that it's full of vendors that are very competitive and they use features to differentiate each other. So how do you compare apples to apples? So we took an approach of breaking what an, or an event message broker should do into four areas. One is the, what is a core event broker, cash, storage subsystem, brokerage, uh, schema management and proxies and so on, what you would consider the core part of the product. Then came the client facing APIs. And we were very prescriptive about this. We wanted a pub sub API as opposed and, and separate from what could be considered a, a higher end API, like K-Streams or some other form of streaming SQL and so on. Why? Because we wanted to have very granular APIs um, and prescribe what the other layers should be. So we were, we were very specific that we wanted a PubSub API first in our North Star direction. 
obviously we are we are Kafka users and we use K streams, but we we didn't jump into that deep water first. We went first with our North Star approach to learn the ropes of adopting a, a new and better uh, messaging software and also being specific of what the pops of API should be. And, and this comes later and I'll bring, come back to this topic. Obviously, um, you want software that is, has capabilities for management, that is backup and recovery, that they can support various other features. And now you'll see the connection with our requirements. You know, we want HADR, of course, we want security, we want the ability to build, we need multi-tenancy and so on. And then finally, other. All these differentiators that these vendors come in, WASM, let's run um, polyglot functions inside our broker, um, different storage systems. Now you see a bit of a, a warfare where the message brokers have decoupled their storage and now they're, they're using S3 or any other object store to store their messaging. So that arms race between the, the message brokers is something that if you break it in, in the categories helps you compare to Apple, apples to apples. So with this in mind and those requirements that I'm putting up here, we have functional requirements like pop sub, we want a pop sub API, it has to be multi-tenancy. Aspirationally, we want sub-tenancy as well. Nobody's offering that at the moment. Schema management, mostly from our cybersecurity, we want to enforce schemas in our pop sub fabric. Event retention policies, geo-replication, uh, exactly one semantics. That's a biggie in, in, in the marketing of, of these message uh, products. They, they offer exactly one, deduplication, different complex things. Even now, transactions, which is a bit weird and a bit contrived for message brokers. It takes a lot of effort to turn a pops of fabric into a transactional system. So maybe you're... Maybe you shouldn't be doing that with, with messaging software. So, so th those are the kind of things you have to look at. From a non-functional requirements, when you see our, I didn't mention numbers for our fraud platform, but you may imagine there are, are big banks that use our fabric uh, and, and our capabilities for fraud have a high throughput, low, low, tenants, low latency requirements, high availability. Obviously, they want to be multi-tenant and um, have disaster recovery. Uh, the portability, not necessarily so, but we, are, we aim to be agnostic to the platform vendor where we're uh, deploying. Some of our partners are interested in deploying in their cloud provider of choice. So that comes from, from that angle. And security, our cybersecurity wanted pluggable authentication, pluggable authorization. So when we look at these, re these requirements are pretty straightforward, but something that came in, and I didn't mention dates, but we're looking at the end of 2022, 2023, now we're in deployment 2024. At that time in 2023, the North Star philosophy was to adopt event sourcing. So we thought we would have repositories out there in the various instances around the world that will be uh, data uh, state stores, if you will, or databases that would be eventually consistent. And so we wanted to move towards event sourcing, reconstruct state using logs. So we wanted, we wanted at that point, the requirement posed to me was we need um, a messaging software that is very robust uh, log so you can do event sourcing which means that you want something that maybe can outflow into an object store and you can read from the object store into your block storage uh, seamlessly and lower your costs and so on. We moved away from event sourcing for this iteration of a platform. We don't need that feature at this moment, but the requirement remained. We wanted a product that could do it if we need to move in that direction later on. So anyways, that, that, those are the requirements. And this is a short slide on the vendors that, that we uh, picked from. All of these vendors are great. All these folks, and it's very hard to choose which one. Uh, Confluent was the incumbent in this case, and we still run Kafka in our transactional systems. 
You have a vendor like Red Panda that offers what I would call the Formula One of a Kafka implementation in C++. Um, and then you have a couple of vendors, top vendors with the Apache Pulsar offering that data stacks and string native. Um, if you look at the functional requirements and non-functionals, you get the idea um, that in the case of Kafka, a lot of the things that we're looking for are add-ons. So geo-replication, um, th th uh, tier storage, um, HADR, that sort of thing. Those, these are features that are added. And we find that in, our, in that um, arms race that I mentioned in fraud, our customers come in with weird requirements because they fit their fraud use cases. It's very hard to scale Kafka, as you may know, because storage and broker components are tightly coupled. So you look at a new use case that explodes your events and then you got to reshuffle your clusters to accommodate that use case, it's hard. And if, if you have multiple customers, you can realize economies of scale with multi-tenancy because these clusters are running separately. So it, it, it is a complex problem. Um, so that's pretty much the story. And when we looked at the vendor that we picked, we picked String Native. There were three reasons. One is String Native sort of has the leadership in um, contributing to the open source community for Apache Kafka, Apache Pulsar. And in particular, the, op the Kubernetes operators that they offer m aligned us better with our direction of adopting GitOps because these operators made Pulsar more uh, declarative, which I mentioned is one of the principles we want to follow. The other one is the benchmarks were really good. Uh, these vendors, but Pulsar performs really well, and by breaking storage and brokerage into layers, which Kafka doesn't, it's, it makes it perform better and more tunable. So that's not only the reason, but Stream Native in this case was very prescriptive of how they configure the benchmark and why they achieve the results and what you could do. Because there are various ways to skin that cat and do different tuning and so on and different topologies to achieve the, the latency and, and throughput that we were looking for. And then finally, the API compatibility with Kafka. When we started this journey with Pulsar, Pulsar only supported the Pulsar API. So you could, you could install Pulsar and make it fake a Kafka system with a Pulsar API. Uh, because the line protocols are pluggable. Everything pretty much in Pulsar is pluggable, so it was pretty straightforward for them, for the community, to come up with a wire-level compatible Kafka protocol for PubSub. But as time progressed, right now, Pulsar supports all the APIs in Kafka. So you can run your case streams, uh, you can run PubSub and any other of the Kafka protocols in Pulsar. But so you get the best of both worlds. You get the scalability of the storage subsystem separate from brokerage. All these features are built in and you can run your Kafka protocol as well. So that was a good thing because we began this journey with our North Star. You know, I, I said, let's, you know, start with the greenfield part of our architecture gives us the freedom to be creative. And then we look at the hard stuff, <laughs> moving our transactional production systems to Pulsar. We ran a functional test with um, Pulsar replacing Kafka from a functional standpoint. And all the APIs behave exactly as the Kafka APIs from a functional standpoint. We're working on a performance stress test of our transactional systems to see how it works. Okay, so we, pick, we picked Apache Pulsar, but this is like a bad breakup, right? Our, our senior managements come in and say, well, wait a minute, we, we were completely bound to Kafka, you know, uh, decoupling our Java Spring code from Kafka APIs. That's surgery, that's major surgery. What are you gonna do, uh, you know, jumping from Kafka to Pulsar and then tightly coupling us again to a Pulsar API. So you gotta do something about that. So with the prior architecture decision record came a second architecture decision record to pick an abstraction layer. Again, to be compliant with endorsed our principles. And that's where Dapper came in. Now I've been following Dapper since KubeCon 2020 in San Diego. Uh, I met uh, the folks from who are now Diagrid and um, I really liked what was behind Dapper. 
But Dapper hasn't been an easy thing to adopt at FICO because we are, for on one hand, very uh, uh, Java Spring type company. And in that community of developers, if it doesn't exist in Spring, it doesn't exist. So it's, it's a, more like a wall garden. That's one thing. So it, it culturally is difficult to think, oh, you're gonna, you're gonna bring another uh, framework that works with Java. It, it works pretty well with Java, actually. But you bring a different paradigm on that regard. The other thing is when you look and you read about Dapper, it kind of looks like a service mesh, but it isn't. And it's a key difference. I and mean, it has some features because the way it's deployed it's it positioning inside Kubernetes in a way that you can do things that a service mesh does, but it's not a service mesh. It's not an Envoy proxy on layer four of your stack filtering every packet. No, it works at layer seven. It's an application developer framework at that level. So that's what you gotta compare it against. So when you evangelize Dapper inside a company like it happened to me, you are dealing with these things. So number one, you have a network people saying, well, that thing is a service mesh. We already have a service mesh, and we do. And on the other hand, uh, you have people, why do you need this thing? Why, you know, what's wrong with Java? What if you, well, it turns out we do want to develop in other languages, you know, Python and Go and so on. Like you've seen in Mark's slide, there's, there's interest in building things. It, we even have, um, uh, software written in C++, some of the core high-speed, low-throughput, low-latency low software for transaction fraud is C++ and, uh, and Rust. If. Anyway, so we, we wanted to pick a, trans, a abstraction layer, and that's where Dap, uh, Dapper comes in, and I'm stuck. Um, I am not going to cover Dapper, I mean, there are better venues and presentations of what Dapper is about. Um, so I think it, who doesn't, who's not familiar with Dapper? Okay, you, I owe it to you. So Dapper is a framework for building distributed applications. You can build your applications in pretty much any language. And in fact, the API to Dapper can be HTTP REST or it can be gRPC. For gRPC, Dapper offers an SDK for the particular language you're in. So you're not writing to gRPC directly. You're writing to the SDK, which makes life easier. If you don't want to get so committed to, to Dapper from that API standpoint, you can go to HTTP REST. Dapper is built around building blocks. So these building blocks offer functionality that is typically a cross-cutting concern that you have in your application development uh, concerns. So you have state stores, pop sub you have secret management and, and even workflow and so on. So these are building blocks that you as an application developer don't wanna write from scratch. And um, not only that, but you also don't wanna be um, just coupled to a single state store, DynamoDB or something else. Every one of these building blocks has implementations for different technologies and different cloud providers. So that were very appealing to us from a pub sub standpoint specifically. And that was the, the entry point for us. Not all the cross-cutting concerns and building blocks that Apple could offer, but specifically for PubSub. So when I presented this idea, the first thing that came to mind, so requirements. Okay, you're bringing some abstraction layer. It better support gRPC and HTTP REST, because that's a requirement in our North Star architecture. Every API has to support both. It has to be extensible. It has to support end-to-end -end transaction warranties. So we want that. And it has to support schemas on the contract with the three protocols, JSON, Abro, and Protobulbs. It has to do that. And then it has to be performant, because uh, when, you, when you use th things like Istio, you pay a price in performance, CPU and memory and so on. So the concern was, well, you're gonna chew up our, and it's gonna be expensive. And then OIDC for authentication is a must. And then finally, on the non-functional side, we need payload data encryption in motion. Okay, so how do we do that with Dapper? Well, when we look at the building block, the pub sub building block in Dapper for Apache Pulsar, it didn't have all these things. It, um, so I'll get into the story of what it, it was missing and how we fix that. Just five minutes? Okay, I'll hurry up. So to make a long story short, obviously one of the 
inclination says, oh, we can write that. We'll write it in Java and so on. When you look at what Dapper does, it is very hard to write yourself in Java and, and, and so on. One of the key paradigms in, in Dapper is that it uses the Kubernetes sidecars. So in the sidecar, all the logic is sitting there separate from your application. You have a very natural boundary. So you don't have all that code running with your application. It's running in the sidecar. And so you have a clean API into Dapper. The second thing is, um, the second approach was, well, you know, we can um, just use Java Spring. I mean, you think about it. It's Spring is a separation layer between your application and whatever Spring is doing. But every time you make a change, you have to recompile your application, you have to deploy Docker, and so on and so forth. Dapper doesn't need that at all. You, all you do is reconfigure Dapper, and you probably restart your container or your pod, and you're up and running. So we did some of those experiments, and they worked really fine. So let me move to the decision. The decision was, OK, we can adopt Dapper if you guys solve these gaps that we have. So how do we solve the gaps? Well, it turns out that all the features that we wanted can be done at the sidecar level and configured in a manifest in Kubernetes, which is how Dapper works, without touching the application-facing API. OIDC, it's in the sidecar, and it's configured. We can authenticate with Pulsar directly, native Pulsar, or OIDC. We need a schema management. It's decorative. It's in the sidecar. It's, it, we don't have to change the application-facing API. So to make a long story short, all these features were implemented within a year by the Dapper community and with the help of the folks from Diagrid. Um, and the only feature that was missing is transactions. We, Remember, I mentioned transactions. Well, it turns out that the Apache Pulsar Go SDK does not support transactions, did not. And it started supporting transactions on Apache Pulsar 3.2 last February. So the reason Dapper didn't have it is because the Apache Pulsar Go SDK didn't have it. Uh, the sidecar in, in Dapper is written in Go. You can develop in pretty much any software, in any programming language, but the sidecar for obvious reasons and performance and so on is written in, in, in Go. So very quickly, how do we, so those are the knowns gaps. The, the unknown was performance. We ran a performance test uh, with our metering. One of the use cases, the well, first use cases in Northstar is metering. We want to capture metering data from Northstar applications so we can generate the billing. Um, it passed with flying colors. CPU performance, CPU we can constrain to 5 to 10% of the pod. So that's a nice feature because you can, with requests and limits in your pod definition, you can say, Dapper, you only have 5% of CPU. And for pubbing messages to our metering uh, application, Dapper only consumes 48 megabytes. Now, this is serving a Java container that has one gigabyte of RAM and one full CPU. Dapper only needs 48 megabytes to do that metering activity. So the takeaway from us was you can manage what Dapper needs to fulfill that uh, application capability. And so it performed with flying colors for us. Obviously, you can tune. So metering data is th that kind of thing that you can buffer maybe five metering records per every business transaction. So every five business transactions, you buffer five metering records, and then you send them in a pub. But you're risking that you can lose five metering records if the pod goes down, because these are stateless decisioning pods. And then you pay a price, because you don't want to lose any of your metering data. But still, it's very tunable. So what are our next areas? Uh, we are working on the migration strategy for our current systems. We want to adopt Pulsar in our transaction fraud systems. And so we're working in that direction. Um, some areas of opportunity include uh, adopting the URSA engine. We would love to see Dapper use for cross-cutting concerns in other capabilities. I have a presentation at 2 p.m., on the platform engineering uh, called the uh, co-located event on how to integrate cross-plane with Dapper and use it for a different purpose, not application development, but for platform engineering. 
And so what's next? We'll continue decomposing our business capabilities, uh, interconnecting our services with event server, introduce Diagrid Conductor as we scale Dapper. I haven't mentioned Conductor, but it's a SaaS uh, management, SaaS-based uh, dashboard for managing Dapper at scale. We're not at that scale yet, but we will. And so as you have these sidecars or what Dapper calls Dapper Shared, which is a daemon set, so you're, you don't have that, uh, sidecars everywhere, in either one of those appointment models, uh, when you scale, you want a place where you can manage your Dapper code, your upgrades, your configuration, and so on. Um, so with that, I, I think I covered most of these points uh, earlier. And so with that, I, I'll thank you very much again. And if I think I'm out of time and I don't have time for questions, I guess. But I can take questions afterwards if you are interested. I see some familiar faces out there. Hey, thanks a lot, guys.